Dream Center Church is a restoring place, a place where we make disciples of Christ, teach and train them to live as children of God, and to thrive into who He created them to be. We believe that this is the best time on earth to be alive, to experience the end time harvest of souls for the kingdom of God. Get ready to be renewed, recharged, and restored to go out and take the gospel to your world. The Word of God is true. I always bring this up here. I usually read from my notes, but they came out of here. But this is the Word of God. If you don't know it, you'll do without it. And you have God speaking to you each one of us, on how to live in victory, how to prosper, how to walk in divine health, how to have a great family, how to build a legacy for your family. It's all right here in this book. The world rejects this because they said, how can man write this book? Man did not write this book. <clears throat> Men put a pen to what God told them to write. Some people say, well, how can how men write that down? That's just men writing stuff down. But yeah, that sounds good if you want to argue about it. But guess what? If I wanted to hire somebody to come take dictation from me and dictate letters to type, I'd say it. And I'd say, let me see what you got. And if she didn't or he didn't get that right, I'd go I'd fire her and get somebody else. I can find somebody to write what I want written. And if I can find somebody, surely, surely God can find someone to write down what he wants said. And when they found those, uh, <clears throat> the Dead Sea Scrolls, there was Isaiah's in there. There's a lot of scripture in there. And it was amazing how God had protected his word for over 2,000 years. And it was almost exactly like we have it today. That's God. God, will, God has given us his word and he'll protect his word. And he'll honor his word. And he's exalted his word above his name. His word is alive and it's full of power. It doesn't have partial power. It's full of power. <clears throat> and our job, as we endeavor to come into this kingdom of God, is to put his word in our hearts so that we become his word. Amen? We read his word to give us hope. Well, maybe don't, we don't go there, but we get hope when we go there. And hope is not just wishful thinking, but joyful, intense expectation of good. Hope is not wishful thinking, it's expecting. And God said it. It's impossible for God to lie. If he tells you something about yourself in there, it's more, it's more true than what you're going through, even if it's, what you're going through is totally opposite of what he said. What he says is true. You're living under the darkness of a lie. Living under the kingdom of this world, the kingdom of Satan. We all came out of this kingdom of darkness. Not a one of us ever born into this thing, right into the kingdom of God. In fact, we were born into this earth, but then we had to be reborn into his kingdom. And once we come into his kingdom through repentance, which means we turn from the way we used to live, we change our way of thinking. We just don't say, I'm sorry, I got caught sinning. That's not repentance. That's trying to get out of it. When we come to him with a changed heart, with ears to hear, the Corinthians tells us that the, because of the condition of our heart, the veil gets lifted and we begin to see God's kingdom. Everywhere that Jesus went, he brought the kingdom of heaven at hand. And it manifested right in front of him. And then he's called you and I to walk the same place that he walked. And don't worry, the devil will try to talk you out of it, telling you you can't do it because you're not Jesus. And that's true. You're not Jesus. But you are anointed of Jesus like he was anointed with the Holy Ghost. He gave us the same Holy Spirit that indwelled him to live forever. If you've come into the knowledge of that and you've accepted it by faith, that's why we're called to go preach the gospel. People need to know the truth. And if you don't go preach it, they won't get it. And if you go preach a watered-down gospel, there's no power in it. 
And the church has been walking around for at least, I know, 200 years in this nation. Not all of them, but a large majority just preaching mamby-pamby stuff. While the kingdom of darkness continues on, ravaging humanity, believers and unbelievers alike, even believers who have authority to rise above and stop the devil in his tracks. The devil's still here. He's still fighting against the kingdom of heaven. Every time ministry takes place, his two kingdoms collide. And our kingdom wins. We win. Hey, Amen. We win. Do you understand that? No matter what comes our way, we win. Even Paul says to the church in Corinth, thanks be unto God, which always, who always causes us to triumph in Christ. Outside of Christ, in Christ, we always win. If you want to know the truth, because of what his word says, it's fixed. It's a fixed fight. It's fixed. God's word is forever. The, what the psalmist said, forever, Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. It's forever settled in heaven. <clears throat> and it's not for religious views. It's for the common believer, you and I. Born again believers who come into the kingdom as buck privates. Amen. Every promise that God has given the children of Israel and the church belongs to you and me through Christ. And if we don't know it, we won't be born again. If we get born again, but don't know who we are, we'll put up with everything that we've been, that Jesus has paid a price to free us from. <clears throat> Even in his day, he went about preaching, teaching and healing. And he quoted Isaiah. They have eyes, but they don't see. You don't want to have eyes and not see. He says they have ears, but they don't hear. And they have a heart that's hardened. Less at any time, they, who's he talking about? The ones that didn't have eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand, their hearts hardened. Less at any time, they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts. And then they'd be converted, then I can heal them. I think it was in Mark, the sixth chapter. Jesus is in his own hometown. And he laid hands on a few sick folk, but didn't really heal anybody. And it says he could there do no mighty works. And he marveled with unbelief. Jesus himself, the son of God, God in the flesh, living as man, living as Jesus of Nazareth, anointed with the Holy Ghost and power, could not heal them because of their unbelief. He had the power to, he had the authority to, but because of their unbelief, it kept them out. Galatians, no, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 3 talks about the children of Israel and how they provoked God because they didn't believe him. How they tested him. How they upset God because of their unbelief. And it says in the Amplified, they were not enter, able to enter into the promised land because of their unbelief. And then it says in parentheses, unbelief has shut them out, not God. God did not stop the children of Israel from coming into the promised land. Their unbelief did. They had the promises. Caleb and Joshua had the same promises the other ten spies did. The two that believed God went in. The ten that didn't believe God, they never went in. And everyone from 20 years old and older didn't go in because of their unbelief. Unbelief, if that's for me, just tell them I'll come back. Because... They refused. This is what the Amplified, I mean, Amplified says yeah, in, in the uh, Hebrews. They refused to be compliant or persuaded. They refused to be uh, compliant or persuaded. Therefore, unbelief shut them out. Jesus is talking in, the, in Mark, the fourth chapter, about the parable of the sower. He says, uh, be careful what you're listening to. The measure of thought and study you give to the truth you hear has everything to do with what kind of goodness comes back to you. And more besides will be given to you who hear. What you do with the word has everything to do with what the word does to you. Now, some of you shout today because Jamie's not here. And where's Kelly? Uh-oh. Are you back there? Feel free to shout today. In fact, your, your, your wife said that 
you're picking up for Jamie because. <laughs> what we do with what we hear has everything to do with what kind of harvest we get. And let me just tell you, Jesus shed his blood so that you would have the harvest he wants you to have. It was the harvest he intended for humanity before we ever fell into the death through unbelief of what God said when Eve met with Satan in the garden and she believed Satan over what God said. Anytime you believe the devil more than God, it'll get you in trouble. You don't want to believe him. I don't care how convincing he sounds. I don't care how it even looks like it is the truth. It may be facts are in alignment with what he says, but it's not the truth. It may be a fact, but it's not the truth. The truth is by the stripes of Jesus, you were healed, not going to be, were healed. And if we're trying to get something we've already got, we'll never get there because we've already got it. Amen. When God says something that's true in, in, that, in that parable of the sower, Jesus goes, what are you going to do with the truth I've given you? What are you going to do with it? It's the same thing he asked us today. What are we going to do with the truth that we hear from him? The world is in darkness. <clears throat> Make no mistake about it. We have the light. Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. And then he turned later and says, now you talking to his disciples, which is the body of Christ, which is you and me, if you're born again. We are the light of the world. And then he said, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. Let me paraphrase that. Just in the same way God sent me to humanity, I'm sending you to humanity. Then it makes sense when you read the Great Commissions what he commissioned the church to do. You and I have been commissioned, whether you know it or not, to take the light of the gospel to the lost and dying world. We're not fighting with him. We're fighting principalities and powers and rulers of darkness who rule over them. You can get as mad as you want to the political leaders, but if they're not serving God, they're puppets by the kingdom of darkness pulling the strings on them. You can go argue with them, fight with them all you want, but we don't, our, that's not our battle. Our battle is not with flesh and blood, it's with principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. And we as believers carry God's kingdom into this world and is with as much authority and power as we have faith for. You don't have to ask God to give you more power. You need to exercise the power he's already given you. I was going to start with something, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I got to read something to you so you can see what I'm talking about. This world that we live in is still in darkness. <clears throat> what Jesus did was took the keys from the devil and gave it to his church. He didn't lock the demons up. He didn't send Satan to the lake of fire. He's still on this earth because he tells us, stand strong against Satan. Fight him, resist him with your most holy faith. Because he's still here. The same devil, the same demons, the same kingdom of darkness that was here when Jesus was on this earth, which had no effect over him because they had nothing on him because they had no power over him. That same kingdom of darkness that he had victory over, he taught us how to have victory over it too. If, if, we, didn't, if we didn't have to fight it, he wouldn't tell us how to have victory over it, right? He would only tell us to fight the fight, the good fight of faith because it's still a fight. There's coming a time when Satan will be locked up for a thousand years and there'll be the millennial reign of Christ from what I understand. For a thousand years. I don't know why, but God will release Satan again for a short period of time. I don't know why. I wish he wouldn't. But it says that he will. But then eventually he'll be thrown in the lake of fire and then death will be put underfoot. Death will be put under Jesus' feet. There will be no more death. But in the meantime, you and I are commissioned by God as believers. Well, I don't know if I've been commissioned, Brother Noble. Well, here's, there's four places. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the book of Acts. He tells the church, as he's getting ready to ascend into heaven, how to live 
on this earth in victory and subdue Satan in the kingdom of darkness. We don't have to call him to come fight him for us. He taught us how to fight Satan ourselves. Amen. And if we don't know that, we'll sit here and pray for Jesus to do something he's already done. And we'll walk around defeated <clears throat> continually. And we'll think, well, that must be the will of God. That's not the will of God. <laughs> you want to know what the will of God is? It's this right here. This is the will of God. And if it doesn't have application for life on this earth, we're in trouble. But it does. I think the large majority of the church don't even see a, an application for the Bible in modern day life. That could be nothing further than the truth. That could be nothing needed more than the word of God in his church defeating the kingdom of darkness and setting captives free. Let me read you a couple of things and then I'm going to take you back to scripture. We've looked at it for some time, but I can't get out of it and I'm getting more out of it than I did last time I looked at it. But in Ephesians 1, Paul says, I'm, my name is Paul and I'm apostle, I'm the least apostle, and I've come to tell you about this kingdom because he got revelation from Jesus himself. He says, hey, everything, this is verse 3 of chapter 1, Everything that heaven contains has been lavished upon us as a love gift for you and me. Everything that heaven contains, he's talking to the church. If you're born again, that means you've confessed Jesus as Lord of your life. Didn't mean you went to church when you were little. Being born again is an act on your part and my part by faith, declaring out of our mouth that Jesus is Lord of our life. And... We also believe that God raised him from the dead. That's not that difficult compared to what Jesus did when he took on himself sin and became sin for us and went into the bowels of this earth, went through a torturous death, hanging on a cross, and then went into a spiritual battle in the, in the earth. And then rose from the dead by the power of God that Ephesians 1 says that same power lives in his church, which is you and me, to set captives free. What he did was a whole lot worse than what we get, what we have to do. All we do is what he first did, God, I surrender to you. You are Lord of my life. Now don't tell me Jesus is Lord of your life if you're living sinning like the rest of the world. And I don't care who accepts it, what church accepts it. If he says don't do it, and you do it, that's sin. And he says, what good, Luke 6, what good does it do you to call me Lord if you don't put into practice what I teach? That means everything he teaches, we're commanded to put into practice. We're not, we don't even have the privilege to have fear. He said, don't fear. Guess what that means? Don't fear. We're not supposed to be offended. Well, I'm offended. Well, then get out of sin. Yeah, but you don't know what they did to me. I don't care what they did to you. You, you don't have the privilege to be offended. This is a world of offense right now. I mean, any, everybody on social media is getting offended and jumping off on somebody else. We don't have the right to do that. I would just stay away from that stuff. Use it as a tool, but don't get in there and don't give all your life away on this social media stuff and telling everybody what you are, what you're not, and not being yourself. What good does it do for you to call him Lord if you don't put into practice what he teaches? You may not know he said it, but if you want to know what or who Jesus is, because he is the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, with the Word. That without the Word, there was nothing made that was made in Him. In this Word is life and this life is the light of men. The Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is Jesus of Nazareth who became the Christ, the anointed one. But before He was anointed, He was Jesus of Nazareth. Before He was Jesus of Nazareth, He was the Word of God. And so all of the word of God that we have written or he's spoken that we don't know is him. 
Jesus is the word. And people say, well, Jesus didn't say about this and that. You're talking about the letters in red. Well, no, he wasn't quoted from that. But if it said it in Genesis all the way to Revelation, that's him. That's God's word speaking to you and me, telling us how to live and telling us what to do and what not to do. And when we do what he says don't do, that's a sin. And if you go around doing that, you can say Jesus is Lord all you want, but it don't mean nothing. Look, my goal is not you to get you saved. My goal is for you to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. The first step of discipleship is get saved, but that's not the destiny. That's the entrance into our destiny by being born again, coming into the kingdom. Most people think you get saved, go sit in the church, and that's it until Jesus comes. You haven't even read the book. The church is commanded how to live. We're commissioned to heal the sick, raise the dead, and cast out devils and cleanse lepers. You can, you can argue the way all you want to, but you can't take it out of Jesus' mouth because he's the one that said it. Every command right there in Matthew 20, every command I've given you telling his disciples, go tell the rest of the disciples, go into all the world in my authority and make disciples out of every nation, teaching them to faithfully follow every command I've given you. If he gave them a command, it's our command. Well, he didn't tell me. He didn't have to. He told the disciples who told you, who told us. And we're commanded to live that way. You don't have to, but you don't have to go to heaven either. You have a right to go to hell if you want to. It's not very smart. But you can go. And God will protect your right to go if that's what you choose. Most people choose it by default because they don't know the truth. And someone comes to present who God is to them. And they don't present him right. They say, I don't want that. And they keep on serving the devil. That's because they can't see because of blinders. But one day, all this is going to be lifted. Like when, she's, when we were singing, take all this world, take all the stuff we think is. And the only thing that's true in all this is God. And he's good. He is. Uh, he's Holy. The angels and the beasts sit around his throne and they just go, holy, holy, holy is God. Because he is extremely good. He's so good. If, you, if you've got any bad thoughts about God, that's a lie because he's good. He will judge the truth. And you may be in his crosshairs because of ignorance or unbelief or doubt. But when you find out the truth, you better believe it. Because it's impossible for him to lie. And when he says we are the body of Christ on the earth. That's who we are. Whether we ever take our rightful place or not. In the first chapter of John it says. And as many as received him. Jesus the word of God that became flesh. He gives them. I like what the passing translation said when they first translated it. He gives them the, the power to become who they truly are. The sons and daughters of God. He gives them the power to become who they already are. He gives you and I the power to become who he's created us to be when we hear his truth, led by his spirit, and believe him. You can either sit there and just stay stupid, or you can open your eyes and your ears and your heart to the word of God and find out who he says we are and pull yourself up by the power of God in his word out of poverty, out of the street, into prosperity and peace and health because we're the body of Christ. We are his body on the earth. I'm going to read this part to you because I want you to see where we came from. And then I'm going to show you what he said to that man who cast the devil out of him. Because we're called to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, and cleanse lepers. This is Healing Sunday. Every message we have is healing. He told us to preach the truth. It's the truth. I don't believe in healing. I'm so sorry for you. That's like my, that'd be like saying I don't believe in Jesus because Jesus is a healer. Jesus is given, I mean, he's given, the Holy Spirit is given to us as an installment of what's coming. He is, the, this is 14 of chapter 1. He is our promise of hope, the expectation of good for a future inheritance 
for we've all been made alive in Christ. This hope promise seals us until we have all the uh, redemption's promises and uh, experience complete freedom for all the supreme glory and honor to God. Because of this, since I first heard about your faith in Jesus Christ and your tender love toward all his devotion, and his tender love toward all his devotion, I have never ceased to give thanks for you, interceding for you, for my heart is full of thanks to God for you. And I pray continually that the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, would give you the spirit of wisdom. Listen to this. This is the Holy Spirit teaching Paul to talk to the church in Ephesus or wherever the church of body of the Christ is, the Holy Spirit is teaching Paul to pray for that church. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, would give us a spirit of wisdom. Give us, you and me, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. That the eyes of our understanding being enlightened, we would know what is the expectation of good of our calling. And what is the riches of the glory of the inheritance in the saints? And what is exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that's named, not only in this world, but also in the world which is to come. And has put all things under his feet, Jesus, his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. The passion, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The passion translation says, and now he, Jesus, is the head and the source of everything needed in the church. Everything is below his authority. And now we, his church, are his body on the earth. And the completion of him that fills all things with his presence flowing through us. The, the, that was when the Passion Translation first came out. Then it comes over and says, And now we, his church, are his body on the earth, and that which fills him who is being filled by it. That which fills us fills him, and that which fills him fills us. You got it? And we are his body on the earth, and the completion of him, and that which fills him who is being filled by it. He fills us with himself, which completes him. <laughs> That's better than you yelling. Okay, listen to this. And this fullness, Ephesians 2, verse 1, and this fullness fills you even when you were dead like corpses, in your own sins and offenses. Every single one of us who's been born again came from right here. You, you can't look at sinners and look down your nose at them because it, you came from right where they are. And if we look at sinners and go, don't forget, that's where you came from. You better be interceding for them and moving in compassion towards them so that they be set free from the captivity they're held in. We were held as captives in the kingdom of darkness until someone came by the word of God, which is Jesus, and set us free. You and I are called to go set captives free because they're held captive as Satan's belongings in his kingdom of darkness. Let me say that again. Those lost with or without knowledge of the kingdom of God, if they're still kept in the kingdom of darkness, they're held as captives and they belong to, to Satan. They really belong to God, but he has control over them. You and I came from there by the knowledge of the truth and the power of the Holy Spirit that brought us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. When did he do that? When he raised Christ from the dead. Before we were even born. Do you understand this is something he's given to us as a legacy for us and our families that if we don't accept it, we'll lose it. But it was something that was so good, so wonderful, so gracious, so good, so eternal that we lose it. 
That's why you'd be gnashing your teeth and wailing and sitting in the... That part's not as bad as being separated from the goodness of God. The, the suffering in that is nothing like the torment of the heart, knowing that he did that for us and we passed it by. Why? Because we were held captive in our thoughts by the kingdom of darkness. Not by humanity, kingdom of darkness. It wasn't that long ago that we lived in the religion, customs, and the values of this world, obeying the dark ruler of this earthly realm who fills the atmosphere with his authority. He still has authority, but you have authority over his authority. He has illegal authority. The only authority he has over humanity is that which you and I give him. I'm going to say that again. The only authority he has over you and I is that which we give him. Because authority, Jesus said, all the authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. If he has any authority, it's illegal. And he's, held, he's holding the church captive by their lack of knowledge of the truth. And they stayed locked up in bondage when we walk around and live like the rest of the world and watch people get sick and die. And we do nothing to stop it. We are just watching this unfold as if, well, that gets us out of the way it is. That's not the way he set it up. <clears throat> That's not what Jesus left us as an inheritance. He left us himself and his Holy Spirit to live in us full of power that we have by faith. You read this, don't believe it, it won't do you a bit of good. Faith unlocks the key to the power of the Word of God. And don't get cocky. It's not even your faith. It's the faith of God. Don't even get cocky. It's not your faith. It's the faith. I'm preaching to myself. We have nothing to do with it except believe Him. You know what we can do? Believe Him. And the faith He gives us brings us into His kingdom. We, we can't brag about anything. Well, I got a bigger church. Uh, it's not your church. This ain't my church. It's his church. I'm responsible for it, and I'll give an account for it. It's not mine. But you and I both have a calling that he's called us to. And your own personal self cannot disqualify you because the fact that you cannot and he has qualifies you. That which disqualifies us, qualifies us. We're not worthy. That's right. Therefore, he made us worthy by his blood. He became sin for us who knew no sin. He didn't just take on sin. He became sin. So that you and I would be made the righteousness of God himself in Christ. <laughs> I'll never quit thinking about that. We have the righteousness of God in Christ. That's not varying degrees. You're not more righteous than each other. And we're not more righteous than God or he's not more We are the righteousness of God. You're either righteous or you're not. There's no, now you can have varying degrees of faith for sure. Your faith could grow, your faith could wane. But your righteousness, it's just there, perfect as God. Because he gave it to you. We all know what it's like when second, third generations inherit stuff and they run around acting like fools because they think it's all about them. And they didn't have nothing to do with it. But they think it's all about them. We be careful. But you realize it has nothing to do with us. It's all about him and his grace and mercy towards us. When we can get it off our plate into his, his power start moving because we think it's about us. Satan's first thing was, I'm going to be like him. I'm going to rise up. You fool. You're a created being by him, and you're going to rise up and sit in his? Are you crazy? We'll look at him. The scripture says, we'll say, is, this the one that, is this the one that deceived the nations? Don't have no fear of him. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Satan's still in his world, but greater is the one that lives in me than him. Why would I ever be afraid of him? Yes, yeah, so I can walk through the valley of shadow death and fear no evil. Why? Because God's with me. I sit in his, 
I sit in his presence. I go to that secret place. I like that one psalm that says, there's a secret place in God where his lovers go and sit in his presence where he reveals revelation secret of his promises. <laughs> revelation secrets of his promises? Yeah, some of these promises have to be unlocked by revelation secrets he gives us by in being in his presence. I try every day to get in his presence. To get in that secret. My secret place is at my desk, in my office, in my house. I just sit there in front of the window. But it's my secret place. It's not a secret to anybody that knows me. But it's my place. I go to meet him. And I don't do it right. I, my mind runs over here. My mind runs over here. But I keep trying to pull my head back in and grab myself by the ear and pull myself in to say, sit down, be still, and know that he's God. Because he longs to live inside of us. He loves us more than you could ever imagine. I don't know. I'm like that psalmist. I got to ask you this one question, God. When I think about all what, you, what you've done and created, why do you bother with us? Why are you infatuated with Adam's sons? I don't know why, but he is. He's given us authority and dominion over all the works of his hands. Not before the fall, after the fall. Here's my side note. I'll just throw this out there. By what authority, the power did Jesus tell the wind, the waves to stop? Was it because he was anointed? Because he was a son of God. Adam's son. I asked Bill Johnson that. I think it is because he created us to have dominion and authority over everything on this earth. And if you don't think you don't, you won't. Yet you have the power to do so. Let me finish reading this. The corruption that was in this in us from birth was expressed through the uh, deeds and the desires of our self-life. We live by whatever our natural cravings and our insights and our thoughts and our minds dictated. Living as rebellious children subject to God's wrath like everyone else. But God still loved us with such great love. He had such compassion for us. Even when we were dead and doomed in our many sins, he united us to the very life of Christ himself and saved us by his wonderful grace. He raised us up with Christ, the exalted one, and we were seated in heavenly places in Christ. Even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he raised us up together with Christ. When did he do that? When he raised him from the dead. Why? Why? Because before the foundation of the earth, he saw us wrapped in Christ. <laughs> Golly, that's so good. He saw us wrapped in Christ even before he laid the foundation of the universe. Before there was a universe, he saw you and me wrapped into Christ. And all of our life, he's saying, come on in, come on in. Come on into my kingdom. Come in and walk and live in this kingdom. Don't live in this world system. It glamours and shakes and shimmers and you think it's something, but it ain't nothing compared to his kingdom. And Jesus went about proclaiming this kingdom to people who did not know who God was. His job was to represent or to present again to humanity who God was. And if you think God is different than what you see in Jesus, you've got to change the way you think and know about God. If what you think you know about God, you can't find it in the person of Jesus, throw that away because it ain't God. Jesus was good. And that one guy says, hey, good teacher. He goes, whoop. There's none good but God. And I, I say this probably every Sunday, forgive me. But Jesus, I think you're really good. And he says, nope. There's none good but God. Can you imagine how good God is if when Jesus says there's none good but God and we know how good Jesus is? He says there's none good but God. That means he's on our side. He's not against us. He, he's for us, not against us. If he didn't withhold his only son, why would he not freely give us all things? Jesus came to set the captives free. Then he calls us and anoints us to go set captives free just like him and he said this and from now on boys you you've known the father and you've seen the father and philip said just show us the father and he's like philip 
Have you not been watching me? You're not watching me. You're watching God in me. Don't you believe God lives in me and I live in him? Even the words I speak are not known, but they come from my Father who lives in me, who does his miracles and powers of wonder through me. Don't you believe I'm in him and he's in me? Then he said this profound thing, which I know I say this every Sunday. Every note I write on the behalf of this ministry, I put this John 14, 12 in there. He says, and if you believe on me, the works I do, you'll do in greater works. Now, I don't know what religious people want to tell you or how they'll try to unpack that or how they'll try to water that down. But Jesus said, if we believe on him, the miracles, signs, and wonders he did, we would do. <laughs> and greater. We only had three and a half years. How long you got? The rest of your life. Well, I don't know if I can do greater works than Jesus. Then you don't believe him. Then you won't. Because if you believe him, you will. If you don't believe, you won't. What are you going to do with the truth you hear? Okay, I'm going to go back to this, circum this, this particular healing that took place in Jesus' ministry in Luke 11. Because it, it just impacted me this morning. And I'm, I'm telling you, I've been in there eight months. And I'm probably bringing it up every Sunday. But listen to this. Jesus cast the devil out of a man. He began to speak. He had been held captive in his life by a demon from the kingdom of darkness. Jesus saw it, and what was his desire? To set him free. He went about preaching, teaching, and healing. Acts 10, 38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. He didn't anoint Jesus Christ. He anointed Jesus the man, the son of Mary, the son of God who was raised in Nazareth, born in Bethlehem, just like was prophesied. And from Nazareth, he wasn't the only prophet from there. Those guys that said that, there was others in there. Like, for example, uh, what's his name? Went down to Nineveh and preached. Jonah. He's from that area. So, or one of them. Whatever. That's where he's from. Jesus of Nazareth. God anointed this man, Jesus of Nazareth, with the Holy Ghost in power, who then, in consequence of that power, went about doing good, healing all that were pressed to the devil. Why? Because God was with him. If you let God be with you, you'll do the same thing. Because he said, if you believe you can do what he did. Well, that's not what I believe. Well, change what you believe. Don't, ta no, don't take my word for it. Put your nose in this book and find it and read it for yourself. He will tell you things that are impossible. But with God, nothing's impossible. The devil will tell you, you're there, you're stuck there forever. You're stuck there forever. Not if you believe God. There's not one person beyond becoming everything that God called him to be, just like himself on this earth, if they'll trust God. The madman in the Gadara. I ain't seen anyone in the streets as crazy as this guy since we've been in the ministry in the streets of the Charlotte. I've never seen anybody as bad off as a madman in Gadara. But when Jesus set him free, he was sitting clothed and in his right mind. Why did Jesus go over there? Only to see this guy and come back. Because he went over there, set him free, came back. And when he got back, Jairus is there. What was he doing? He was undoing the works of the devil. There's two kingdoms, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of darkness. Jesus said the thief, the kingdom of darkness, comes to steal kill and destroy. I've come that you might have life and have it more than more than enough. Do you think God wants you to set you free from poverty? Of course he did. Jesus died for it. Do you think Jesus wants you to be free from sickness and disease? Of course he does. He shed blood for it. He took stripes for it. Does he want you to prosper and be in health even if it's so prosperous? Yes. If anyone tells you that God doesn't want you to prosper and be in health even if you're so prosperous, don't believe him. Because he said it, beloved, I wish above all things. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to the church. Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and you be in health, even as your soul prospers. <laughs> Let yourself believe it. Nobody can stop you from believing but yourself. No one can make you believe 
except yourself. And believing is not just a result of how you shake you up and throw it out. It's a choice you make. I believe God. If you do anything, believe God. If you do anything, believe God. So Jesus has cast the devil out of this man. And they say, you just cast out the devils by the devil. And he begins to say things like, you did do, show us another sign. And Jesus is just, this, this man was held captive by the kingdom of darkness. And the kingdom of heaven came to him and set him free. Do you know why? Because the kingdom of heaven is always going to win. If the person in that position of authority understands and believes God and does according to what God tells him to do. It's not always the same. You want to look how to get people healed from blindness? Don't go. Just pick one thing. Look at Jesus. Every time he went, he was different. What did he do? Listen to God. Guess what you need to do and I need to do? Listen to God. When you come to minister, don't sit there and do what you did. Listen to what he says do. What if Jesus had done what he did last time when he did the blind man in out and took him into the country and then if God didn't tell him he made mud sticking in the man's eyes, he wouldn't do him any good. He did what the Father told him because when God's word came to him and to his heart, it had power and life in it. If it wasn't the word of God, it doesn't have the power. It could sound good. It could sound religious, but it's without power unless it's from the mouth of God. And he will speak to you and me. He said, if you call upon me, I'll answer you. That means when you call and come upon God, he's going to answer you. So when Jesus cast the devil, this man, they came up with all these different things. And somebody said, well, you're just casting out the devils by the devil. He said, no, no, no. If I'm casting out the devils by the devil, I'm working against the devil. And that's a divided house. It won't stand. I like to flip on the other side of that when we get to that point and say, if he's working against God in healing, that won't stand. In fact, he's only doing what the Father tells him to do. Then what did he do? He set the captive free. He set the men free from the demonic activity that kept him from speaking. He said, know this for a surety. Let me read this to you. Yet if I'm casting out demons by God's mighty power, the kingdom realm of God is now come really upon you. It's been released upon you, but you still reject it. Listen to this. This is where Satan stands today. This is not happening only in Jesus' day. And now that he's in heaven, it's not the same. It's still the same. He's going to tell you the condition of what Satan does in this earth. And for I don't know how long this, this guy was alive but all the believers of God in his life had watched this man stay deaf or maybe mute in their presence. They just put up with it because that's how this man's mute. He can't talk. That's how it is. And they say, well, come see, come saw. Not Jesus. If I cast a devil, this man understand that the kingdom of God has come near to you. Satan's kingdom Excuse me. Satan's belongings are undisturbed as he stands guard over his fortress kingdom, strong and fully armed with an arsenal of many weapons. Satan's belongings stand undisturbed. I don't know how old this man was, and I don't know how long he'd been in bondage, but he was one of Satan's belongings. And he stood undisturbed until someone came and challenged him on it. And Jesus was the one that did it. He said, Satan's belongings. I kept thinking the whole time Satan's sitting over his arsenal. He's not sitting over his arsenal. He's watching over his belongings. The captive's one he's taken. We were in that place of that captivity in Ephesians 2. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he raised us up together and made us sit. You're no longer in that authority when you realize who you are in Christ. He's, God has raised you up together and made you sit together in heavenly places in Christ. You are on this earth, but you're also seated at the right hand of God in Christ now. And there's those still held in captivity. And in the church, there's still people held in captivity. And we go about watching it and just saying, well, I guess that's the way it is. Jesus didn't do that. Where God told him to, he went and ministered to set the captives free. He said, if I have 
cast the devil out of this man. Understand the kingdom of God has come near to you. Satan stands guard. Excuse me. Satan's belongings are undisturbed. Satan's belongings are undisturbed as he stands guard over his fortress kingdom, strong and fully armed with an arsenal of many weapons. But, but, when one stronger than he, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. God in us is stronger than Satan in this world. I don't believe you heard me. God in us is stronger than Satan in this world. But when one stronger than Satan comes to attack and overpower him, the stronger one will empty the arsenal in which Satan trusted. What is this arsenal? What are the weapons he uses against us? The thoughts in our minds. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. And we take cap thought, every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. He plays with your mind. And if Satan convinces you in your mind, he's got you held captive. Jesus came to proclaim the truth so that people would be free. And the Satan's belongings, which used to be you and I, are now in his kingdom. And he can't touch us. And it's time to be quit putting up with Satan, holding as his belongings humanity on this earth. When God has given the church, you and I, the power to proclaim truth to set the captives free. And here's what he said. When one stronger than Satan comes and attack him, overpower him, the stronger one will empty the arsenal which he, he, Satan trusted. The conqueror will ransack Satan's kingdom and distribute all the spoils of victory. The spoils are what the enemy holds in his possession. His belongings. This man was one of his belongings. And Jesus set him free. And then he said this. This is a war. And if you're not on my side, you're against me. And if you don't gather the spoils, if you don't gather the spoils with me, you'll be scattered. That means if you're in the body and you don't do what he's asked you to do, scattered. It's not extra credit to heal the sick, raise the dead. It's our commission. I don't care how unpopular it is or how unreligious it seems to the world out there or to the organized church. But when he tells us to set captives free, that's a command. When he says, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, he that believeth in his baptized will be saved. He that believeth not will be damned. Then these signs would follow the believers. That's you and me. In my name, they'll cast out devils. They'll speak with new tongues. They take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it won't hurt them. And believers will lay hands on the sick and set the captives free. And they would recover. If you don't gather the spoils with me, if you don't go take Satan's belongings from him that he holds illegally, captive humanity, quit fighting with him. Have compassion in your heart to set them free. Don't judge them as sinners and wish them to hell. It, Jesus said, the way the sins, the, 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 how's he go? He says, whoever sins you forgive, I forgive. Whoever sins you retain, I retain. Do you understand what he said? Whoever sins you forgive, I forgive. Whoever sins you retain, I retain. Is it possible that believers have retained sins on some and kept them in that bondage? It's time we become the church. It's time that we become the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That he is the head and source of everything needed in the church, everything that's needed, that y'all sing, all I need is Jesus. All the church needs is Jesus, which is 
the Word of God. Amen. All right, I'm done. That's a good word. You know why it's a good word? Because it ain't mine. I'm going to bring it to you like you showed it to me. But We're called to be like him. We're called to set captives free. These signs would follow believers. What are they doing? Casting out devils. Speaking with tongues. Get, get, take up serpents. If they get bitten by something, it ain't going to hurt them. They drink any poison, it won't kill them. And these believers that can't die, lay hands on the sick and they'll go. If you're where God called you to be, if you're, where, if you're where God's called you, you're protected. People say, we're not promised tomorrow. We are. As believers, <laughs> we're promised tomorrow. If we're not in the kingdom, we ain't promised the next five minutes. Who's your promise coming from? The devil who lies? <laughs> the promise of the God come to us by faith. We got to know them before we can believe them. If we don't know them, we can't believe them. But when we know them, we believe them. If you can believe, nothing's impossible. Well, we're going to curse cancer before we take communion. And here's some things Jesus told us to do by the Word of God. He is the Word of God. This is through uh, the book of Peter. Be well balanced and always alert because your enemy, the devil, roams around and says he like roaring lions looking for his prey to devour. He's talking to the church. Watch out for the devil. He's running around trying to kill people. Be alert. Balanced. Take a decisive, he didn't say sit back and watch. He said, take a decisive stand against him with your most holy faith and resist his every attack with strong, vigorous faith. For you know that your believing brothers and sisters around the world are experiencing the same kind of troubles that we do. Don't think like you're the lone ranger if you're going through troubles. But if you're going through troubles, you know who you are. You don't worry. Paul says, for me to live is Christ. No, it's for me to live, I'm anointed. I can defeat anything. But what's better for me is to go on to be with him. But to die is gain. Jesus tells us to take a decisive stand against Satan and resist his every attack with strong, vigorous faith. Jesus commanded us to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils, and cleanse the lepers. Jesus told us that if we believe him, we would do the same works that he did and greater works. And we believe. Jesus spoke to a fig tree, wind the waves and the seas. He spoke to leprosy. He spoke to sickness. He spoke to demons and they listened to him. He put this in my heart that when I was, when I was burying my brother with cancer to quit putting up it and start fighting cancer. Every time you minister, curse it. That's what I'm doing. So if you have cancer in your body or someone in your family has cancer or you know someone that has cancer, stand to your feet. If you have cancer, someone in your family or somebody you know has cancer. If you know somebody, stand up for them. We're not going to do anything except speak to that cancer just like Jesus spoke to a fig tree when the waves and the fever that was on Peter's mother-in-law, we're going to tell that cancer to get out of there and to die. And then we'll pray for any of the sickness that's here too. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the authority vested in us, through the authority he gave the church, because our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, we have the authority over Satan. Hallelujah. James, Jesus told his disciples, when they'd been out and casting out devils and healing the sick, they came back, man, we were just whipping up the dead, we were kicking, he said, yeah, that's great, wasn't that great? He goes, yeah, you know what's better than that? Your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Your name's written in the Lamb's book of life. That, that your name's written in that book is a true source of your authority. Our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Therefore, that source of that authority that we walk in is because of that. And we curse cancer in the physical bodies of the people's names that we call out right now. Now, you call the name that you're standing for. James, Mary, Wesley, Jill, Elaine, Terry, Anita, Jill, 
Marty, Taylor, Allie, Carolyn, Adora, RM, Betsy, Miss Davis, Nina, Susan, Gina, Phil, Olivia, Lee, Tony, Marcia, Thomas, and Bob. Cancer, we're speaking to you in these bodies. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the authority given to us as members of his body, because our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, we command you to die. Cease and desist your maneuvers now in Jesus' name. Come out of their bodies now. We command you to die and dissipate. Finish your work and get out. Your work is done. However, if this cancer is not physiologically, maybe it's demonic. Jesus told us to deal with that. He said, cast it out. So in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, if this cancer we're speaking to is demonic in nature, not physiological, we command you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, loose them, let them go and come out of them. In the name of Jesus, by the authority, we command you to do so. And furthermore, if there's any cancer in this room within the sound of my voice, either here or on tape or in, on podcast, whichever way you hear this, we speak to any cancer cell within the sound of our voice and we command it to die. We may not even know it's in our body yet, unknown, undetected. We don't have to wait till it grows into a big mass to curse it. Every cancer cell within the sound of our voice, we curse it to its core. And if it's demonic, we said, loose them and let them go. Furthermore, any other sickness in this room or anyone listening online, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you to be healed and whole from the top of your head to the bottoms of your feet. Every bondage, broken. Every addiction, broken. Every pornographic sexual addiction, broken. Every physical ailment, any, any organ, any, any, any blood issues, any sugar issues, any muscle issues, any brain, cerebral brain damage, hurt to the cerebral, cerebral uh, system of our body, into our nervous system, our organs, our hearts, our lungs, our blood. We speak the peace of God, the healing power of God over us from the top of the head, the bottoms of the feet, and all the way around as we walk protected in this kingdom in Jesus' name. And we say peace and be whole and be still in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Shout for joy. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Someone, some kind gentleman came up to me a little while ago and said that came in here before and we had done that same thing right there with the cancer and he went back and he was cleared. Amen. That's a testament. Amen. All right. We're going to seal this in covenant. This is what we do this for. Everybody got the elements right I can see him Jesus took the bread and broke it he said this is my body that's broken you can't break wonder bread you ever notice that you ain't gotta break real bread what, what our bakery makes is real bread he took the bread and broke it he said this is my body that was broken for you as often as you eat it do this to call me affectionate to remembrance of everything I tell you. This is unleavened bread. This is my body that was broken for you. As often as you do it, do it to call me affectionately to remembrance of everything you've told us. Jesus, today we call you to remembrance of all that you told us, of what you commanded us to do, how to live. This is your body. It's broken for us. By the stripes of Jesus, we are healed. And then Jesus took the cup and he held it up. He said, this cup is my blood to seal the covenant that he was getting ready to fulfill. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So when he took this blood, he shed his blood. It was once and for all. And he came back and before he walked the earth for 40 days, he said, don't handle me yet. I'm taking my, I'm going to heaven. 
because I haven't met, been to my father. And he goes into the heavenly holy of holies and pours out his blood on the mercy seat in God's mercy seat in heaven and then comes back. This is his blood that was shed for us. We do this to call you to remembrance of all that you promised. And you fulfilled. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you one thing before you go. If you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, what in the world would you wait for? There's two kingdoms. The only way to come into the kingdom of God is through Jesus. That's it, because... His ransom price was paid. There is no other ransom price. There is no other payment for what we owe except his blood. If you want to come into this kingdom, you've got to come through him. And to do that, you have to surrender and say, Jesus, you're Lord of my life. And I believe God raised you from the dead. Then you're born again. And then you should do what he told the disciples to do. Don't go do anything until you get filled with my Holy Spirit. For you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. I like to think everybody here is born again, but I, don't, I can't say that's for sure. But just in case, repeat this after me. And believers alike, re repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, today I've heard your gospel truth. Today I declare, I surrender. Jesus is Lord of my life. I believe in my heart. That, Father God, you raised him from the dead. And according to your word, in my confession of faith, I'm now saved. Now take my life and do with it as you wish. You also said that if I ask you, you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. So, Father, I ask in faith. Believe and I receive when I ask. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And I receive your Holy Spirit now to live in me forever. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Stand to your feet. Merry Christmas to you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Stretch your hands back there towards Gary. Gary's getting ready to drive across the country back. He's going to leave here, get in the plane, drive over to California and drive a truck back. So we're going to pray the heads of protection around him. Again, we just speak the peace of God over you and the, and the wonders of God and the, uh, just the, the peace of God as you travel and you return home safely in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forever. Amen and amen. Thank you for being here with us on The Voice of Healing. When you're in Charlotte, North Carolina, join us for our 10 a.m. Sunday morning service. Our website, restoringplace.org, has all the details on how to find us. While you're on our site, check out ways you can volunteer at the Dream Center. Need someone to answer questions about us or pray with you 24-7? Call our prayer line at 704-246-4595.